Terry Watkins, Executive Director of the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum. Thank you for joining us today as we gather for a conversation about how to find common ground on this sacred ground. I want to welcome John Kennedy, former Secretary of State and our current Vice Chair of the Memorial Foundation Board of Trustees. John, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Carrie. I love working with you and I appreciate this opportunity to join you today. Our Better Conversations signature program has brought to light valuable conversations over the past year. And it's been important for our work to continue in this arena. We'd like to thank Sarah and Kyle Sweet and their family for sponsoring today's program. Carrie, I think it would be valuable if you'd share why this program began in 2020 during our 25th anniversary. Well, in the aftermath of the bombing now 26 years ago, amidst the confusion, fear, and heartbreak, people clung to one emotion. That was hope. It was the same hope that gave family members, survivors, first responders, and the community members at large the strength to come together in conversation in those coming months. People listened, they talked, they shared, raw emotions. These countless hours of conversations ultimately led to the creation of the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum. And looking back over these now 26 years, we remember the value of bringing people together in conversation to gain different perspectives so that everyone has a chance to be heard. In 2020, we began these conversations, better conversations, our signature program, thanks to an initial gift from Bank of America. This series was modeled after NPR's Krista Tippett program that aims to change how conversations work by looking at the questions we ask and by honoring each other's perspective. I remember well the day we hosted our first Better Conversations with Krista at the museum. We had a full house, something that seems kind of unusual to us today. We're thankful through technology that we continued Better Conversations throughout 2020 and into this year. And hopefully, we'll get back to meeting in person very soon. Uh, we might add that Krista is a Shawnee, Oklahoma native uh, which is 100% responsible for all of her success. Um, and upon graduation from Brown University, she became a journalist and diplomat in Cold War Berlin. She's fearless. Over the years, her work has earned her the Peabody Award, the National Humanities Medal awarded by President Obama, and she's also a New York Times bestselling author. We're so pleased to have Krista join us today in the studio via Zoom. Krista, if you could just give us some context about what you've, what you've observed over the years in terms of as a journalist of bringing people together in conversation who likely have different opinions and what, what you've found in finding those solutions. And then just, just talk to us about finding common ground on this very sacred ground. And then we'll leave the rest of the program to hear from our audience. Time for you to voice your concerns, share what's on your mind. So with that, Krista, just take, it, take us through the, your program today. You would think that having lived on Zoom for a year, I would know to unmute myself. Um, thank you so much, Carrie. I think, um, as you said, I, I'm gonna make a few remarks, just for a few minutes, and then what I'd really love to do is be present to um, the people who are in the room, as we say, in the Zoom room, um, and talk about what's on your minds and hearts, and you might uh, have questions that are not questions that have answers, but that need to be posed. Um, because I think in terms of context uh, for what I've learned, we also have to really take in the context of this year we've just lived through and what it has worked inside us and what it has shifted. And we're not completely on the other side of this yet, but this has changed what the, that other side is going to be. And so I, and I really don't think in our culture at large, we've really let ourselves dwell with this. And, you know, it has been, I've sometimes said that this has been a species moment. It's, 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 it's been this extraordinary thing that all together as a human race, we had this shared experience. Now, of course, there was so much variety and nuance in terms of how this experience landed, but it did land on all of us at once. And it has been a trauma that we've been through together, and it has also 
opened up a great deal civilizationally that really changes the meaning, even Carrie, of the question you ask about um, bringing people together and opinions and and finding solutions. And um, so I hope I'm not going to be dissatisfying in this first part, but, but, but what I really want to put out there as I begin is just um, that coming out of this year as we take stock and make sense, um, I think even the language of finding solutions, we have to work with what we mean when we talk about solutions and opinions and even common ground. Um, we don't live in a world right now of problems that have simple or obvious fixes. We live in this early century, again, in a species moment, where we have challenges that are intimate and they're also civilizational. And if anything, what the year we've been through has put a finer point on this, that the forms that came down to us in the 20th century, how schools work, how healthcare works, how politics works, how an economy works, how we live with the natural world. Um, we are a generation of our species that, that really has to take on the remaking of things. Now we have to remake them in concrete ways close to the ground where we live. And so, again, I don't want to say the solutions, the new forms in Oklahoma are going to look different from the new forms in Minnesota where I live. Um, and in other places in the world, but we have the capacity and are called still to be learning from each other in a new way, partly through this technology that I know vexes us, and yet we've also learned of some of its gifts this year that we already possessed and didn't know, like the fact that we can be together um, even in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and I think in terms of common ground, I, 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 I work very lightly with that language now. It's important, but what's more important for us to reestablish is common life. And my observation over the last few years, and I think more, more um, dramatically in, in more recent times, is that this when we have this notion of common ground that is kind of based on this idea this language that i grew up with let's just all get on the same page um, it is the common ground that assumes agreement that assumes shared convictions and opinions and we don't have enough of that going around right now we have really really we have really deep divides in our convictions and in our opinions and yet more than ever before, we are called to figure out what common life means and um, not to start with opinions and convictions because we, we can't start there right now. That's, that's, a, that's a piece of reality. But I think with can we find shared questions? What are our shared longings? What are our shared callings? And that's a move from what do I believe and what is my position to what kind of people do we want to be? What kind of a society do we, want, do we want to be? How do I want to live? How do we want to live? Is this the culture we want our children to inherit? And even if and as I know we don't have solutions or ready answers to that question, that question is calling for our attention. Um, I may have quoted the poet writer Maria Rilke last time I was with you in that room, which is unimaginable, that room we were in together. Uh, but he has really been a, a North Star for me, this notion that Rilke, who also was a turn of century person like us, who lived in the early 20th century with its wars and its, its, its global pandemic and its refugee crisis. And he talked about how in human life, um, often the most important questions are, are questions we can't answer until we're in a place to live the answers. And I think that defines so much of the work we have to do, so much of the work ahead of us. And what we do in a moment like this is we have to live the questions. We have to put our bodies and our minds, our creativity, our hearts, whatever togetherness we can muster towards 
throwing our lives at that question and living our way into answers. So obviously that's about heart. It's about, it's a, it, it has opinions in it. There are convictions that play a role, but it's also, it's about our hearts and bodies and minds and lives. It's about interior work that we all have to do. It's about conduct as much as it's about conviction. And so these challenges of our time are asking for our highest human capacities and our gifts. Uh, they need us to create new, whole new spaces. And I think carry that language of sacred ground. I think even some work in imagining what sacred ground we share or even just towards the imagining of that if we if we can't get there right now but in this context when i say that that this the challenges of our time are asking for our highest human capacities and gifts i really want to also name the fact that what we've been through in this past year means that at a physiological level Rising to our highest capacities is actually not is actually too much to ask of a lot of us. There has been so much loss, loss of lives, loss of livelihood, loss of certainty and security, loss of dreams, the death of dreams that we have for our children, the loss of rituals. My son graduated from the University of Oklahoma this year and there was no graduation. I mean, those things add up and I recently interviewed um, a psychologist who talked about something we haven't talked about in this year, even as we've had statistics about the virus or about social isolation, which is what this has done to our nervous systems. Um, that, that a year ago, just the first news of this unknown virus al alive in the world sent all of our, us, in, us set our, our stress responses into a cascade. And so that has taken us into our places of fear and into how we act out of fear, uh, not our highest selves. And so I just, I think I name that because it's, it's the reality that we're standing on and, and we see, we see action and reaction that is more out of fear that often comes out looking like anger or violence, hostility, um, that is also about what's happened in our bodies. Um, and then alongside that fragility, it's been a year of ruptures and reckonings. I live in the city in which George Floyd died with a police officer's knee on his neck, nine minutes and 29 seconds that the world watched. Um, it's been a year of, um, it's been a year in which we've had to revisit the very story of who we are as a society. Uh, and that's also a loss of ground beneath our feet, that even if we want to walk towards that and honor it, it's frightening, it's stressful. Um, just last week from my makeshift recording studio in my basement here in St. Paul, I interviewed Joy Harjo, our US Poet Laureate, who grew up in Tulsa. And when I read her books and when I talk to her, that, that Tulsa that she grew up in, um, the stories and songs and images and ancestry, um, and even the meanings of the places, I didn't learn about that Oklahoma, that Tulsa. I didn't learn about the, the massacre that happened in Tulsa 100 years ago this year. And I know the National Memorial and Museum is is pondering that and how to mark that. Um, I grew up in Shawnee with Tecumseh next door and Seminole and, and Muskogee. And I knew those names of places, but I didn't really learn the stories and the histories and their meaning for the people whose nations they describe. So what I'm describing is, and these are just some of the things I've been pondering this year because of the particular life I lead and the the places I come from, but we're all going through this re, this new understanding of the ground on which we stand, the places we came from, what is possible in the world ahead, um, and that's heavy, 
And if we don't take in the heaviness, we can't actually walk into it together. We can't actually accompany each other. It's such a, it's been such an extraordinary thing um, that this virus um, and actually the technologies that as much as they are a source of unhealth have allowed us to stay connected to each other. Even in the negative uh, qualities, even if the, in the terrible qualities of the virus, it has reminded us that we are a human race. Um, and I, you know, as somebody who works in media, I'm very aware of how the story of our time that comes to us through media is very often a, the dysfunctional story of our time. It's about uh, the most, the, the, what is corrupt and catastrophic and failing um, on every side. There may be different heroes and villains in our different media we're consuming, but the orientation is towards what is dysfunctional, towards really towards what we're against more than what we're for. And that's not the full story of our time. It's not the story of our time that we experience when we walk outside our doors and we, we meet our neighbors. Um, we see acts of goodness. We see good people. We see acts of kindness as ordinary. And we also, I would wager everyone in this room, this Zoom room, um, is part of throwing your life and your story, whatever that is, at what can be built up, what can be healed. And maybe even when that participation right now is letting those questions inhabit your body. The question of how to take that seriously and make it real. So I see this as a gathering of the generative story of our time, which is as real as that dysfunctional story. And let's, yeah, and let's talk about what's on our hearts, what's on our minds. I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to answer the questions, but I will love um, helping surface them. Well, thank you, Krista. Uh, and thanks to you and your team who've been working with this so hard over the past year to make this a reality. I think it's clear that our job of bringing people together will never be done. It's so daunting, but so necessary. How do we practice in our everyday life techniques that help us find the common ground? Well, I guess I guess I want to kind of flow out of what I just said, and and I I think maybe there's some pre work of if that is a if that is an impulse, if that's a desire to to really sit down and think through what you mean by common ground. Um, I don't think now it can mean um, getting people who think like us, who agree with us. I think it needs to be about how do we create a new kind of common life? And I guess some, some more practical offerings that I'd make about that, some starting points would be maybe don't start with, you know, I think that we have all these reflexes, we have all these very well well-flexed muscles. And so I think the impulse with a question like that, if people are taking a question like that, is to think about an issue, right? What's the issue we can gather around? Right. And I think that's kind of broken right now. And again, I am going to keep saying this. It's, it's broken because we have real problems <laughs> with our political system and our society. It's also broken because we're all a little bit broken right now. And so we actually have to be gentle and forgiving. So I would say, how about thinking about bringing some people together around a shared question. So people who, so our, your shared love for your children, or, or even to bring people around together around what are the big questions that you are holding for our society right now, or for our city as we move into this next chapter? Um, can we just bring our questions and, and give voice to them and put them in the room? and see what emerges there. And, and really be sure you invite people who have different opinions, but you're not gonna connect around the opinions, and that's okay. I think we have a sense that it's only productive in the society when we, when we set up a debate and an action plan and a strategy and a solution, and we really have to let go of that right now. 
um, I think a, sh a common ground right now. And I have I've spoken with groups of parents who are on really different sides of the political spectrum coming around, coming together around this, just saying it, it, a common ground is they have a shared desire that this is not, that this fracture and animosity and everyday violence um, of our society, this is not what they want their kids to grow up experiencing. This is not what they want their kids to inherit. And so just coming together around that shared longing and again, just letting that be true, letting it be an open question, but opening the possibility that you talk and walk and live your way into some kind of grappling that you probably couldn't have imagined if you didn't frame it that way. The other thing I would want to say is um, another reflex we have when we think about coming together with others, and I think this is fueled by media, of which I'm part, is to, <clears throat> is to look at the people who you most vehemently disagree with. When you say the other side, let's say it's the other political side, um, to have a feeling like who you need to get together are those most strident voices, that they represent that other side. It's really important that we, that we loosen those stereotypes. I think starting with the most strident voices is a, is a surefire way to not proceed. Um, but there is a huge spectrum of humanity between the most extreme positions on either side of the spectrum, right or left or whatever you want to, however, however that falls out and whatever the issue is. There's a huge spectrum of sensibility and people who are holding questions alongside their convictions more robustly between your position and, and others. And so look, you know, don't do your homework just in terms of where people stand on issues, but in terms of relationships, do this six degree of separation. This, you know, I think we've all, um, the, there's, everybody has a story in these last few years about the brother-in-law or the cousin who drives them crazy at Thanksgiving dinner. So I would say don't invite your, your cousin or brother-in-law, but you might invite somebody else's. Because it's, you know, another, another strange thing, another strange reality we just have to honor is that it's in our families can be, actually be the hardest place to start some of these things. It's just a strange truth of us. Krista, uh, when I listen to multiple episodes of your show on being, and I like to listen to several together, I feel like I'm hearing a symphony for my soul. So yeah. that's a plug for on being. I really love it. Um, mm -hmm. Could you talk about the role of forgiveness following a tragedy, whether it be the Oklahoma City bombing, a mass shooting, or a personal tragedy that may not be as public as the bombing or these shootings? You know, um, I always go back to a conversation I had just in the earliest years of this project by a woman named Debbie Morris. This was the years of the um, walk, uh, Dead Man Walking movie and Sister Helen Prejean, um, which was about her advocacy for people on death row. And Debbie Morris, one of the men who she wrote about in her book and, and who was um, depicted in the movie uh, sympathetically, all, with complexity, but as a human being. Um, uh, Debbie Morris, when she was younger, was uh, kidnapped by this man and raped, and I believe her boyfriend may have been murdered. It was She was the victim of a terrible, terrible crime. And when there was this compassionate portrayal of him, everywhere in media she had to experience that and reckon with it. Actually, and what I'm remembering now is that she had formed, I may be mixing things up, but I think she formed this friendship with one of the parents of the, someone who died in the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, she talked to me about, and she was, a, she was deeply Christian, and she talked to me about her journey to forgiveness and how what she finally realized is that the, that not forgiving and holding on to that anger was only hurting her. And she, she used this language, and I think this is the rationale of the teachings of forgiveness in our religious traditions. Um, 
that forgiving was not was about was about letting go of something that she she was holding on to and filling herself up with something that was better for her and that was forgiveness it is as much an act that you make for your own well-being and ability to move on and flourish as it is something you do for the other person you know she said uh, and I believe he had actually been executed by that time so she said even if he had not I would never have wanted to be friends with him I wouldn't have had lunch with him um, but I could stop hating him and you know there's this there's a, a teaching and well, I've, I've actually seen it attributed to um, many people uh, I, I most recently heard it from a Buddhist teacher um, that hanging that that hanging on to anger is like it's like drinking poison and thinking it will hurt the other person um, I say this I have also spent time with people who were part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa I say this knowing that forgiveness can be offered instantaneously but it is also a huge act of courage and it's a place people have to get to and come to um, but there's a reason there's a reason that it's part of spiritual traditions it, it looks like an external act and I think maybe the way it gets publicized in our culture and maybe when it gets publicized it, with less complexity than it actually had has is a declaration um, but I think I don't know that's that's me thinking out loud and I I, I, I again I, I really want to honor um, that it's not that it's that we're talking about something very hard and we're talking about something that has to be lived into also and that everybody can't be asked to do or called to and it's certainly not everybody does it at the same time so right exactly great insight and and, and um, for the zoom wall you guys get ready with your questions we're going to ask Krista one more then I'm coming to the wall and if you're online please type those in the chat box and we'll ask Krista to comment on those but Krista, has, have we as Americans lost the, the skills in finding common ground? I mean, do you think we're so fractured that we'll ever be able to come back together? <laughs> well, I mean, I think this is why I invoke the, the strange and dramatic moment we're in, because I think right now it's really hard to imagine that, isn't it? And I, I think that's behind your question, and I share that. Um, I, I don't know how we're going to remake our political system. You know, I, I, I believe that hope is a muscle. It's a choice. Uh, it's not about being optimistic or wishful. It's about seeing reality, seeing the complexity of reality, seeing what is hard, and seeing and committing to see also what is possible that I can put my life towards. So hope is a choice you throw your life at. I would say that right now at this moment, I'm not hopeful about our political process. That's not to say that I don't think it will resolve. I, I think it will. I think, you know, having a long view of time is, oh, sorry, my front door. Um, having a long view of time is actually really helpful because if you look at history, you see, just like in the life of a person, in the life of a society, you go through these times and these are often times that afterwards you know I, I mean one afterwards you see that that the absolute dysfunction made transformation possible that the transformation couldn't have happened without that level of despair something that I'm thinking about a lot right now and I was this morning I was in a prayer meeting of um, a virtual prayer tent here that's happening every day of the of the trial of Derek Chauvin and um, we were talking about um, I, I, I think about the I think about how the people 50 years from now or 100 years from now people for whom we will be the ancestors will look back at this moment what they will see and one thing I know is that while we feel and are so fractured and 
you know, uh, of the many layers of complexity in our time, there's this, there's this rising up of the multiplicity of our identities. And yet, what I know is that those descendants of ours will see an us. We will be a we in that when, when time becomes history. And so I think the question for each of us is, what is the part I'm going to play right now, close to home, what I can see and touch? Great. With that, we'll take a question from the wall. Anybody want, want to be the first question? I'm happy to jump in. Um, Thanks, Krista, Susan. thank you so much for being here today with us. I'm Hadil Yazji, and I have the great honor of serving as a Oklahoma City National Memorial Museum trustee. In your opening remarks, you, you touched on healing, and I've been reflecting a lot on that and what's required for a person to heal. Uh, yesterday, I actually had lunch with uh, a friend of mine who is a descendant of uh, a victim of the 1921 race massacre, so you mentioned that. Um, but I, my question to you is, what would you say is, is a precondition to heal when you've experienced such great trauma and sometimes multi-generational trauma? Yeah. I, I don't have the answer to that, but I, I, you know, there are, there are people and places in the world that do have more of an experience with that, like um, people living in South Africa, people living in Northern Ireland. Um, there's an organization called Facing History and Ourselves. Are you familiar with them? Um, they work with teachers all over the world and they and they they have let themselves be taught by people and places who have moved through that kind of trauma that you're talking about right that i don't have the authority to speak about but um i am so impressed with see i think you know i think this is another thing about the america that i grew up in really the 20th century America is we, we kind of, you know, not not thinking that we have anything to learn from anyone else, right? That we, we, we're the great nation with all the answers. And that's, we're seeing, we're seeing. We have so much to learn and so much to grow. So much to grow just to be true to, to what we say we believe in, to, 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 to being who we say we are and want, and I believe most of us long to be as a nation. Um, so that, that is actually one very concrete recommendation I would say is that looking at face, facing history and ourselves because they have curricula um, and really I think, I think that is actually one thing they've learned from societies uh, and communities coming out of that kind of trauma and violence is that a, an incredibly important place to start is in the schools with the education system. Thank you. Who's next? Uh, good morning. I'm Allison Taylor, and I'm a retired a banker and community volunteer. Uh, and Mike, I'm very interested in the commitment to our public education children, who I'm very concerned with are the ones truly being lost in so much of this process. Uh, and I'm also very interested in how we stop being so quick to label each other rather than getting to know a person before we presume we know who they are or what they think and how can we start those conversations. Yeah, yeah first of all, just to honor that point about the children who are lost, you know, and there's so many ways that's happened in this year with people with children out of school and it's it's one of the things that you hear about as um a statistic and it's just so heartbreaking that you can't take it in or i speak i can't take it in and um and so i just want to let that be in the room um uh and standing before that pain um Letting it be true, naming it is 
is this is is a, is a move towards stepping towards it or asking the question of what we can do in terms of the the labeling again that's also where our brains go when we're stressed the way we are right now so like you know that that is really that is really um hardwired and and that's also just something to that we get to be aware of nobody's at their best right now i don't know anybody at their best right now um so and and i really i you know i think that this matter of starting a new kind of conversation a new kind of relationship um doing the internal work um getting curious that doesn't come naturally right now it, it doesn't come naturally for the reason i just said and it doesn't come naturally because of the political culture we have and getting curious is actually um i think i actually think it's uh, so i think curiosity is a moral muscle and i think that um we do because of this environment we walk around thinking we know right like we learn something about somebody like how they voted in the last election or what neighborhood they live in you know whatever and then we we just know we think we know everything about them and we don't and the truth is that we are all complicated and strange and contradictory uh, you know, one of the favorite people I interviewed in the last few years was Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, even though he's a behavioral psychologist. And he wrote that book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And his book is about what we're learning about, I think we called it, how we contradict ourselves and confound each other. We do this naturally. None of us, if you really laid out all of our positions and our orientations, even towards issues, adds up computes um, sometimes we're we are we are compelled to make uh, take positions or, or 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 take a stand like like vote for one person to represent hundreds of millions of people which doesn't sound rational to me um, and then we get defined by that one position but that doesn't that doesn't add up to our complexity so so what so one of the things that can be done i think in any kind of setting and i think you can even you can even do this in in more professional settings when you it, is think about how can we invite people to bring more their more of the fullness of their humanity and 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 one thing that's really important is where do you start the conversation so if you start by asking people an opinion or belief or conviction question or position question that's where the conversation will stay if you ask people a question about if you ask people so one of the questions i often ask or some variation on this to in my interviews is i ask a question about what was the spiritual background of your childhood i don't i uh, most people have a really interesting answer to that question but i don't ask the question for the answer i ask the question for where it plants people in their bodies in their memories interestingly that question of the spiritual background of your childhood for all of us has a lot of questions in it it's a place of searching um, in different settings where that's not going to be the appropriate question so for example if there's a theme of an event and so this would be more this might be more appropriate for different kinds of civic or professional if there's a theme there's a, there's a word, there's a, a, a phenomenon you're talking about. Um, I will often ask people, or I think a, and a, a good first question can be, that's very unthreatening, people don't feel like they're being asked to be revelatory, is um, what is your earliest memory in your childhood? Or in, your, in the background of your life of hearing this word or of having an experience of this thing we're here to talk about now? If you ask people a memory question, if you ask people a childhood question, it actually takes them out of their heads and into their bodies because memory is embodied. And so it immediately plants people in their bodies as fuller human beings. And what I also find is that when people talk about their childhood, they don't feel like they have to be so pre presentational and performative as they do if you ask somebody, what do you think about this now, right? What is your opinion on X? They're going to give you their adult presentation. 
that if you ask them the question of childhood, there's, there's, you know, they'll be really honest about how things didn't add up or what their questions were or what their confusion was about it or who were their role models. And that's a really different place to start. So that would be my best advice is start in that human place. And then you can absolutely get to all the complexity and the, and the factual stuff that you want to get to. But if you start there, you get there differently. I think our friend Linda Cavanaugh has a question. Here, you got to unmute Linda. Linda's used to having people do this for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're still muted. How about Gwendolyn? Do you have your? Do you have a question? Sarah had a question. I know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I had a question in chat, and I prefaced it with, I didn't mean to be a wall of text, but I noticed even, you know, pre-COVID, there is this movement towards, I, I hate to say the word, ex, you know, extremism, the way extremism is used now, but I mean it in extreme or excessive individualism, so much that they are separating themselves from the norms of a common shared humanity and that it's you know it's not the individualism of the 60s it's the individualism of, of now i'm me i'm on my own island i want my own rules and you know i could live my life on that little isolated island but we can't but you know this was happening pre-covid i noticed and yeah. the isolation we have behind you know covid has accelerated that and exacerbated it. Yeah. So, so how do we begin to, you know, get out of that thinking or draw people together when they're so convinced that everything's about me and I'm just me and nobody else is even important or necessary? Yeah, well, that that me focus is a good American tradition, right? And we actually have to we have to move beyond that. And that, it really is in our culture. And you're right, it's. I mean, what I, this, this picture I described of coming out of the 20th century with this idea of how the world works and America's place in it and, and how our society functions and who we are and who we've been historically and coming out of it with institutions that just don't work for us anymore. Primary institutions, our schools, our healthcare, our economy. Um, that you're right that's been building for a few decades and 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 more in recent years and so what you're you know i i it is it, it is about there's an individualism theme but i think and i think behind all of that there's a fear base there's just so much fear and um in many ways as you say and you're right before COVID, the ground started to drop out for people in terms of things like the future they thought their children would have and that and that that, that is taken away from them um the economy changing so that doesn't make it any easier but i think if we start with an analysis of essential fearfulness as opposed to the combativeness is what which is what fear does to put on armor and be taken seriously. It gives us different ways and try to position ourselves as human beings with other human beings. Uh, Debbie Johnson, I believe, has a question. I have to unmute myself as being this. Um, I have a pretty straightforward question. You fear, one of the very first things you said at the very beginning of your talk was that we are living now with a shared experience collectively due to the pandemic. Um, at the risk of being a contrarian, I'm going to be a contrarian, and I'm going to say, is it truly a shared experience? It should be a shared experience. Historically, it certainly is a shared experience. As a historian, I would say it is. But I, I personally feel as though I know people who are living in many alternate universes from mine. Yeah. So talk to me about that and talk to me about, was it a shared experience? How can we make it more of a shared experience? How can we collectively remember it as a shared experience? Yeah. Well, that's such a 
great question. How can we remember it as a shared experience? What I so to nuance what I said, I we we have collectively undergone. in our different lives, in our different circumstances, and even in our bodies, has as much variety as there are human beings. Um, and, but you know, other societies have not fractured around, the, like there, in other societies, there has been um, more of a shared sense of this as a shared challenge than, than in the United States. And I, I think that this gives us things to ponder as we move into whatever, into, you know, beyond this crisis period. Um, so I agree with you. And yet, and so, yeah, so when, when I talk about the experience of a communal trauma, uh, a, a globally, globally, globally experienced trauma, I think the work of figuring out what that meant and what we do with it is all going to happen later. And I, I do love that question about how do we remember, because I, I think how we behave coming out of this is going to shape the answer to that question. We, we, we can't quite shape it right now in the moment. We can't, because we're, everybody's surviving. I mean, we're coming, we're pulling out of that. But we have been in a long period of people just being in survival mode, like we're, we're back to our animal selves. And that is, isolating okay we'll go back to Linda let's see if we can let me ask you this because you use the term communal trauma mm -hmm. and yet when we look back on the lives that our parents and grandparents had world wars great depression here in Oklahoma the Dust Bowl surely they had the same communal traumas but they seem to have handled it differently perhaps I'm wrong or perhaps they just didn't verbalize it. But is there something fundamentally different about us now than, say, 50, 60 years ago? Well, probably our historian could answer that better than I can. I mean, I mean, again, when we look back at those experiences, um, what we see is that there was a lot of upheaval and change afterwards. So I, th I think that really is the question. Uh, that we are the generation that is going to walk into. How does this change us afterwards? Because right now we're just in the middle of it. And, but I, I do, I do think there's something to this. You know, I've talked to people who live through, who remember polio as a plague, right? In a way that we can't remember that now. And they've talked about the difference between it would be something that um, that they know they knew people they knew children who were being quarantined or dying and but it was always something that was here or there and this experience of something being everywhere is new I mean it, it is new and it's because we're connected and it is overwhelming I think for us it's just I don't think we can comprehend it and yet. And, yet, and we are the generation of our species that is having this experience for the first time and having these technologies that allow us to be in rooms like this. I, I would recommend the show that we just put up for On Being for next week is about um, with Brian Dorries, who has this, this public health project they call Theater of War. And they started with Greek tragedies, but they do ancient plays. They've done the Book of Job. They do texts that have stood the test of time. And they're using Zoom. They were doing it in prisons and hospitals and schools, and now they're doing it, you know, I watched this, they did the Book of Job in Knox County, Ohio after the 2020 election with this group of people you would never see together in a political room right now in our world. And something really meaningful happened. And they're just getting ready to launch this global amphitheater on Zoom to, to and he talks about communalizing trauma and that that's something that, that, that the Greek tragedies and that the ancient amphitheater did. And then discovering that we have this technology that means you can have an amphitheater that has 15,000 people from 49 countries in the room at the same time. So look, 
what I will say is that's not mostly how Zoom is being used, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, this is a wonderful thing that we're having. We're having really bad experience in nature, and there's a lot of. I mean, we have to humanize our technology. We have to grow up Zoom and the internet, and there are a lot of really destructive possibilities that are that are being realized from being able to have 15,000 people from 49 countries communicating. But there is also this possibility, this generative possibility. Gail Jones, I think you have a question. Well, there were two things that hit me, and thank you, Krista, so much. Oh, my God. You've just opened a lot of eyes, I think. One of them was, where does ethics come into common life? And I liked, because I think sometimes we wonder where ethics is, period. Uh, and then I loved your statement, dysfunction makes transformation possible, whether we want to transform it or not. But I, I love the term common life, but where does our ethics come into that? Thank you. Well, I would say, thank you. I would say that... Um, I think that's another, bringing up, bringing up ethics is another area where we've just had this seismic shift culturally just in a couple, of, in a few decades that we're catching up with. And so, but what I mean by that is I think the world I grew up in, there were, there were defined places for for ethical formation and moral formation to happen, right? I mean, we I went to church three times a week, and everybody I knew did that. And um, and I mean, it's really it, it, I mean, it just this is just naming a whole other thing. This, this whole other change that's head spinning in a couple of of decades which is just no time at all in history that we've gone from a society where we had these places where, you know, where in this, in this culture, you know, everybody went to church or worship of some kind. People inherited, and this is true globally, and it's not just true Christianity, people across time and human cultures have inherited a religious identity, and these were the places of moral and ethical formation, right? And they've inherited that, like they inherited the town they grew up in, their eye color, their hair color. And then it's a very short period of time, that has loosened. And so you have these new generations. Now, you know, we're, we're so one of the things we have to figure out as a society, and I, I, use the, I really like the language of moral imagination, uh, because I think the time of moralizing, you know, m morality and moralizing as th they're, it was more possible 50 years ago in this country to say there are certain ethics, there are certain moral standards, there are certain rules, there are guidelines that everybody's learned somewhere and we can all agree on, and it's just not true anymore. And yet, I don't find younger generations, and you know, it's now something like 30% of people under 30 have grown up with no religious formation. Well, so where is that? And I've talked to people in universities who say they feel like like this task of moral and ethical formation is falling on them. And that's not, I mean, and, and maybe that needs to be part of the picture, but right now that's not what they've been trained for. And in fact, there's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of difficulty and tension in talking about that. So, so here's a big question civilizationally we have to answer is, you know, how do we, how do we create a shared moral vocabulary and, and imagination in a world with this kind of, I don't even like the word diversity, I don't think it's big enough, with, with, the, with the full array of humanity as we are coming to see it and honor it. What, but, so that is huge, but also how thrilling if we can, in good moments, to, to be a generation of our species that has that work to do and to make that as expansive um, as humanity. Sarah Sweet, you had a question earlier, I think. Well, hi, Krista. Thank you so much for 
for being here. And if this might speak a little to some of the comments from, from Adam and Thomas in the chat, but um, I listened to a, a podcast on happiness and one of the um, directives that this gentleman recommends is that when it comes to the other or, or um, you know, taking sides in, in this episode is about love your enemies. And he said that his recommendation is really that it has to start with people who you have in common and, um, and just sort of being willing to um, call them out when, when someone who you agree with them, but they, they're, they're crossing a line into um, an attack that is personal or an attack that is on someone's character versus versus an issue or a or a you know political stance or something like that and and um and and he's I've been trying to do that and it is very very difficult when it's someone that you love and you and, and when it's someone who you also you tend to maybe agree with them you give up that righteous indignation that you, you know, that you can kind of feel when you're, when you're, um, it feels just, so good. <laughs> yes. When you're dismissing someone that you, that you disagree with, but it, when it's someone that you love and agree with, um, but it's not a productive part of bringing us together, then, then that also has to be addressed. And, um, and it, it, so it's almost like you have to start with people who are on your team, so to speak. And um, that was just his viewpoint. And so I was just curious, you know, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I, I think that that goes along with what I said earlier about not thinking that if we're not engaging the person who's most different from us or who we most disagree with, um, which is really not a starting point at all, we think we're not making a contribution. I mean, I'll just name... This is not this is not what you're talking about, but it's another example. The racial reckoning that we have to do in this in this country and in this world, um, a lot of that work needs to be done between white people. There needs to be this whole conversation and truth telling and grappling, and it needs to be awkward and messy because it is awkward and messy. We've kind of been asking. Um, people of color to teach us and to model for us the way forward. And um, so I think like this, and, and what I'm, the reason I'm saying this is because it sounds really counterintuitive because the way I think we've all thought about racial reckoning or relationship has been about engaging across racial difference. But I think a lot of the really deep work has to happen between white people for us to be worthy participants and, and for us to do some of the hard work in having those conversations, as you say, with people we love, people we know. Um, so yes, and, and it's interestingly counterintuitive to start with what is obvious <laughs> rather than to start with what seems really important and hard. Adam, from our friend from LA, do you have a question? Well, yeah, hi. Uh, so th th this is where I get troubled and where I spend a lot of my thought. It seems so easy to move people to division at scale. Partisanship is rewarded in our political system. It's rewarded in our media ratings. Uh, the more divisive it is, the more eyeballs it gets. And Krista, everything that you speak of, I completely agree with. And it seems so individual. How is it possible to move people to heart and place of spirit that you describe at scale in the same way that divisiveness and partisanship is able to move people at scale? Well, it, it's, it's not um, in, a, in a linear, as a linear equation. And that's part mm -hmm. of why, why this is hard. Um, part of the reason division and fighting and threatening and the dangerous uh, atmosphere that creates is because that's our brains. Our brains get riveted by that. It, it's a very, I've thought so much across the years being a journalist, it's really hard to make good news 
riveting, like bad news is riveting. And that's about who we are as creatures. So like Yeah, we go right to the limbic, right? Exactly. And and so I do feel like we are in this moment where we're starting to understand this thing I just said is something we've only understood about our brains for about 10 minutes. So I want to think, <laughs> and it's probably not our generation that's going to make this change, but that that, that is going to be knowledge that becomes a form of agency moving forward. But what I also think, you're right, relationship, true change relationship doesn't scale in the same way. And I'll tell you one of my teachers is John Paul Lederach, who is a peace builder, and he's, he's from the Mennonite tradition, and he, you know, when we, when we see peace accords made, and he's not one of the people standing on the stage receiving the applause, but he's the person who was laboring in the fields, and he has worked over 30 years, he's, he's, he, he re literally helped bring about peace in Northern Ireland, and in places like, um, I mean, all over the world, uh, he's he's been a huge huge participant in this process in Colombia that has been very you know that has really come of 30 years. He a long time ago said uh, he wouldn't take on any project anymore unless the participants were making a 10 year commitment. But that's how long it takes with this if you're building on relationship and as he said, if you're not just resolving conflict but transforming it. And one of the things that he says is that everywhere he's been, so this is another thing that we focus on when we focus on social change, is we focus on, as he said, critical mass, right? Like we say, when did all those thousands, millions of people go out on the streets? But when you look at social change in hindsight, what you also see is that where there's, there's transformation, there is before and after the critical mass, like leading up. If you look at the civil rights movement, like it started in 19, I mean, yeah, but really what we think, it started in 1954. I mean, you could go back farther, but nobody saw it until the, I mean, nobody, I mean, the larger culture suddenly saw it. It was this culmination of things that started very relationally. Um, John Paul calls that critical yeast instead of critical mass. And he says everywhere he's seen a culture transform, it started, and this is how he defines it, with small groups of unlikely people Small, small groups of unlike, like a combination of unlikely people in a new quality of relationship. And not just having lunch once, but starting to share life. And all I can say to you is that I believe him. He is somebody I believe, and, he ha and he's seen it. It's my theory of change. It may not turn out to be true, <laughs> but it is life-giving to believe in this. And I feel like, I mean, right now, we're not in a world where I can travel around and meet people. But when I was out speaking, I mean, here we are. Look at this. This is the generative narrative of our time, right? This is critical yeast and the conversations each of us is going to have with four other people. And I think part of the task is just to take that more seriously than we do. Because it doesn't scale, right? As you said, it doesn't rivet attention. But people I trust who know this better than I do, say that it, it really is making a difference. And we, 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 have to, we have to believe in that. We have to believe in each other. I, before, I know we're almost to time, but I have to shout out to my mother because I have not seen her in a room for a year, which I will get. I'm going to be getting there soon, but I know she's in this, in this Zoom room. And another thing I want to say, when, I, when we talked about moral imagination and ethics, I just want to throw this out, that even as, even as I see uh, religious institutions loosening as the primary or only places for moral formation, I actually think this irony of our time is that that, our, that religious traditions and deep theology, language and practices like forgiveness and repentance and confession and lamentation and redemption, the, these repositories of our life together, of the human enterprise, are more important than they, than they were before. And they're going to be absolutely critical to this progress. Charlotte, do you have anything you'd like to say to Krista? Well, just that I'm looking forward to her being in Oklahoma City so I can put my arms around her. <laughs> so hello. my cop. Yeah. And hello, Jean, that man in both of our lives. Hi, hey, <laughs> Krista. How's my girl? <laughs> nice job, Charlotte. 
I gave Bruce, and I don't take a lot of credit for where she is today. We have a, we have a last question from Tony Shin. Tony, you're... Can you hear me? Yes. Um, we're very uh, proud to be involved in this Better Conversation program at the, uh, at the memorial. And um, at Bank of America, we have a, uh, uh, some programs that we call Courageous Conversations. Mm -hmm. And in Oklahoma, we actually had a Courageous Conversation around the, uh, the Tulsa race massacre. And so we, in a corporate environment, we open it up and allow our associates to share their thoughts, to discuss topics, to, uh, to try to you know, get to a better understanding and, and knowledge. Um, but my question really goes to um, kind of the corporate world and what we've been seeing of late. Um, a lot of people have seen the reaction to the uh, Georgia voting rights law and how some corporate entities are, are taking stances. And I'm proud of, of the statement that Bank of America made uh, in support of the uh, uh, of voting rights. Um, and but I, but I also see risk as far as an institution coming out and, and making a, a, a statement at a, at a level. We've got 210,000 associates uh, around the globe. And, you know, there, there's that trade-off between taking a stance, uh, sharing uh, the, what we believe as a corporation is the, is the right uh, approach to an issue, but how do you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the corporation? And so, uh, Krista, I'm just interested in your thoughts as far as uh, what you're seeing in the corporate environment and how and what role you believe that we should be playing in these issues. Well, that's another question I don't feel qualified to answer, but what I'll say is this period we're in, it's messy, right? Like what you what you just talked about, that that's not something that's ever been done quite that way before, at least in my lifetime. And there's so much of that happening. And it's institutions who are, that are stepping out and it's individuals that are stepping out and there's also sometimes terrible backlash, right? The cancel culture thing, which is just terrifying and awkward. And I, I think, I really feel like we have to buckle our seatbelts. I think we're in this moment where um, with, a lot of, with a lot at stake, like what you're describing, um, uh, there, there's there, there's no path. There's no proof. There's no model for what do you do in this moment. And so pe people and or, or institutions are doing things they haven't done before, and it doesn't always go well. Or I think I think as you say, there will be this this consideration after the fact. Was that the right thing to do? Or how do we do this in the future? Or how do we nuance this? Or did somebody else do it better? And that's just the moment we're in. I mean, the only saving grace here, I feel, is that um, it's all moving so quickly. And the, you know, th somebody gets canceled one week and the whole thing is forgotten the next. I mean, so it's, it really is buckle your seatbelt time. But I, I have to say, we also, I, I don't, I don't think it's just, I also believe that some of the, the, the intense reactivity, the intense emotionality, and the rigidity around a lot of this has also been related to, you know, the, the tension we've been feeling as a society generally in the last years, but especially in this last year, the fact that our nervous systems, our stress responses are on alert. And it's just making all of this harder. But I, you know, I want to say that that is also part of the time we live in that we we, we, we also have to applaud that, that stepping out. And, and most importantly, I think we have to be in learning mode. Whether we're that person or organization or we're another, just say, what, okay, what do we all learn here since we are charting completely new territory? Thank you so much, Krista. And thank you guys for joining us for another Better Conversations today. I, I think we just have to keep coming to the table or, or to the Zoom wall and, and having these talks and just being willing to put ourselves out there and ask these tough questions. And thank you for being willing to step out there and answer some tough questions.
through the teaching of our museum exhibits or our, our online educational programs, these ongoing discussions, and on this sacred ground, we must keep trying to find common ground. You can join us by visiting our Memorial Museum or by taking part in our Better Conversation series. There's one scheduled for every Tuesday in April. Next Tuesdays is at 7 p.m. and it features Oklahoma City Police Chief Wade Gorley and Oklahoma City Fire Chief Richard Kelly as we discuss how to encourage the Oklahoma Standard tenets of service, honor, and kindness that Oklahoma became known for in 1995. You can read about all these upcoming topics and sign up at the memorialmuseum.com. The museum is open for business where we are practicing time ticketing and social distancing and requiring masks. If you've not already found time to come see us, April is the perfect time. You'll be inspired by your experience. As you know, April 19th is our annual remembrance ceremony held on the grounds of the Oklahoma City National Memorial. Tune into the ceremony on April 19th by visiting our website, memorialmuseum.com. And then come to the museum after the ceremony <coughs> from the, and benefit from Cox Community Day with the free admission to the museum. Thank you so much for being part of today, and thank you, Krista, for joining us a year later to have a better conversation. Thank <laughs> you.